Hi everyone, sorry we're starting a couple minutes late, but I'm going to be joined by Rachel Varga. She is a aesthetics nurse. She's a good friend. Hey, Rachel. Hello, my beautiful, gorgeous friend. How are you today? I so, you look amazing today, by the way. Oh, thank you. It's amazing when like you do your hair and put some makeup on and get out of wearing joggers. I've been wearing like Lululemon nonstop. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like put some jewelry on, put some, you know, lip gloss on, you feel like a new person. How are you today? I'm great. I actually uh, started the day off with a nice shower, wash my hair. I have a, a pond at my house and some of the spring ducks have just returned. And I don't know if you remember oh, last year yeah. at the start of quarantine, it's like they were my sanity. I would start the day, go feed them some oats and, you know, get that sun in my eyes and get the grounding. And at the same time, while I'm enjoying some nice coffee and, you know, here I am, it's been a really nice morning so far. I actually have a dress on, so there's no joggers oh, below here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I've got white, you know, it's, it's about 70 degrees here in Washington, DC. And so it feels very spring-like and I'm going to embrace it and totally run with it. So I've got white jeans on and, you know, like I said, I did my hair, made myself look presentable for our live. Well, I am so excited to have Rachel Varga with us. She is an aesthetics nurse. She is a dynamo. She's been on Dave Asprey's podcast. She has a thriving practice. And so women are really interested in asking you all the questions, all the things they feel like are tough to kind of navigate in terms of skincare regimens, technology, products, et cetera. Do you feel like you're up for it? You know it. Ask away. Happy to give okay. all my secrets for what works for me and also what works my what works for my amazing clients where I live and also all over the world. Yep. yep. And for full disclosure, I do work with Rachel. Uh, she helps me select products so she can work with people all across the United States and outside the U.S. In fact, I was humored when I got one of your invoices and it was talking about all the countries you ship to. And I thought to myself, <laughs> oh my gosh, you really do ship far. It's not like it's just U.S. customers uh, or people in Canada. It's all over the world, which I found amazing. So what's the farthest you've actually shipped products to? I have a number of clients in Bali, uh, Australia, all across Europe, Iceland, North America. Yeah, everybody. Everybody wants great skin and you yeah. know, everybody deserves to avoid the the gimmicks and the pitfalls. So I just love helping my clients stay on the straight and narrow, no matter where you are, with both your at-home routines, so your skincare, your dermal rolling, mm -hmm. your skin nutraceuticals, nutraceuticals or supplements for the skin. And also help you age well in the process. And then yeah, also, you know, reverse. yeah, and help you figure out what you can do in the clinic too, if you're wanting to say, get some laser treatments done and things like that. Absolutely. So let's start with the basics. One of the first questions I have is talking about what is the best thing to do for anti-aging? I know that's kind of a, that's, that's a question that could go many different ways, but what are what are the best things in your opinion to help with anti-aging regimens? And let me be very clear. I think people in their twenties are starting to think about anti-aging things. I think it's mm -hmm. not just about middle-aged women or women that are, you know, my mother's age and older. I think people are looking for preventative kind of focuses. And then people like myself that, you know, just want to look, make their skin look the very best and to look age, age appropriate, relatively age appropriate. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, actually this evening I'm doing an online lecture for about 30 physicians and I'm going to be doing case studies on how mm -hmm. I've, you know, helped my clients in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond. And different um, kind of like different age brackets can benefit from starting, say, for example, a basic medical grade skincare routine to start to cover your mm -hmm. basics. We're talking cleanse morning and night, moisturize morning and night, exfoliate mm -hmm. two to five times a week and sunscreen every freaking day. But yeah, in the 20s, mid 20s, sometimes uh, individuals are starting to see that initial loss of collagen or just like a little bit of fine lines and wrinkles between the brows and the forehead, maybe some acne, maybe trying to deal with some acne scarring. So that's pretty typical what I see in uh, clients of mine in their 20s. That's when I started on my path when I was about mm -hmm. 25. And now it's 10 years later. And I feel like I kind of look the same, which is clearly stuff's working for me. Aging and <laughs> aging in reverse. A lot of what I see in women in their 20s and 30s, because so many of them are on synthetic hormones for mm. birth control is a lot of melasma. And yeah. so I know that 
I sometimes will see people asking questions about that. And, and can you touch on what melasma is? Because I think far more people are impacted by that and they just don't even realize what it is. Yeah, so there's kind of a couple of schools of thought here. I've actually done a podcast interview. Uh, Cynthia has been on my podcast, the Rachel Varga podcast, and we'll have you on again as well as mm-hmm. my other show. And I've actually had discussions with genetic analysts that have, um, they suspect that sometimes melasma can actually be a sign of blockage of your detoxification pathways. So this is very new. Uh, This is new information to me as of within the last six to eight months. I haven't seen that degree of information Mm -hmm. of like the internal health and how it impacts melasma Mm -hmm. on the skin. So that's kind of cool. It can just, if you start to notice, you all of a sudden have this uptick in melasma. Number one, get your hormones checked out. And maybe see what your detoxification pathways are doing in your body. We have to start to take cues from our skin. So whether it's melasma or whether it's diffuse redness. So melasma is essentially a buildup of melanin in the skin. And what deposits melanin in the skin is the keratinocytes and the melanocytes. They make pigment in the skin. So that can we can get that uptick in, in brown spots or age spots or melasma mm-hmm. from hormone imbalances but also from sun exposure. So we're talking UVA. So those are the cloudy days, rainy days, UVB, the sunny days, but also the blue light from our devices. Yeah. This is the kicker right now, ladies, mm-hmm. is so many of my clients say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm working from home all day long. I'm like, yeah, you're in front of your computer screen, studio lighting, mm-hmm. if you have a good lighting setup too. And yeah. a lot of it's kind of blue light, LED. And that, uh, what I've seen in the literature from about three years ago, that the blue light reaches about three times deeper into the skin wow. than the UVA and UVB that we get outside. No way. So the ways to mitigate melasma, number one, check out your hormones. Number two, check out your detoxification pathways. Number three, be on a solid skincare routine, including using mineral-based sunscreen every freaking day. And number three, or number four, sorry, good thing I can count. Um, <laughs> You can actually take some supplements to help to reduce skin inflammation from the inside. And this particular product that I work with, it actually has Health Canada approval to make claims for just that. And that's a big deal. Wow. Because when we're looking at countries for cleanliness of food products, skincare products, ingredients in general, alcohol even, we got the UK, then we got Canada, then we got the US. So for yeah, the US is terrible. Awful. Terrible. So there are some pretty sophisticated nutraceuticals out there. So skin focused and targeted supplements, which I work with, which can help to reduce diffuse redness via the mechanism of reducing um, uh, inflammation and also to suppress the overproduction of melanin from the melanocytes. And these are backed by third party uh, lab studies. They're all, they're all certified companies. They're, they're legit stuff, but there's so many skin gimmicks out there, including skin supplements for boosting your hair, skin, and nails. Well, and you know what's interesting is biotin is one of the supplements that a lot of people ask me about. And what a lot of people don't realize is that taking biotin prior to doing certain types of labs, especially people that are getting their thyroid uh, tested, can mess with the results. So I remind people that not all supplements are benign. Here in the United States, there's no regulatory agency for supplements, which is really problematic. So it's kind of like the buyer beware. That's why I tell people don't buy supplements on Amazon. Yes, preach it, sister, um, preach it. Do not <laughs> buy supplements on Amazon. And, uh, you know, you really have to work with a talented practitioner. I'm trying to make sure I waved everybody. I think it's really important to partner, you know, with talented practitioners who are aware of like where the gimmicks are, where are the pitfalls, where are the things that people fall prey to. And I know certainly I'm a middle-aged woman and women at my age are so sometimes so desperate to find anti-aging regimens that they'll buy into whatever they see or, or can purchase. And much to Rachel's point, there's little to no safety regulation in the United States. You know, the EU and Canada do a much better job. So you have to absolutely positively be really mindful of the products that you're working with. Um, Clave said, what is the name of the supplement that you were holding up? Yeah, you can actually just check out some of my favorite skin supplements over on my e-store at rachelvarga.ca forward slash store. You'll see my top mm-hmm. recommendations in there. Also, please just simply reach out, send me an email, mm-hmm. send me a DM, and I'll get some information to you that way as well. I, I check my inbox myself. So if you reach out, you're going to get me. <laughs> 
I know it's funny. I still check my inbox on social media. My team always thinks it's hilarious. I'm like, you are actually speaking with me for mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Question number two. So when we're talking about anti-aging things, what is the best to use? Vitamin C, tripeptide serums. Do these take the place of a moisturizer? They do not take the place of a moisturizer. So what I like to recommend is add things like antioxidant serums, retinols, things like that after you've got your basic skincare routine stabilized. So this is what I walk my clients through. I actually have a free cheat sheet on uh, my sophisticated skin steps as well that everyone can get free access to. But it, you know, you really have to start with your basics and then add in the extras like the antioxidant serum. What antioxidant serums are really good at doing when they're made well, and we're talking about the vitamin C being stabilized because mm -hmm. low quality products, the vitamin C will be on the ingredient list, but has it become oxidized? Is it made stable? Is it actually bioavailable? So when we're talking about the word bioavailable, we're talking about, okay, is that supplement you're taking or is that skincare product you're using making its way into the cell? That's what bioavailability means. So a lot of uh, products, the actives will just sit on top of the skin and they're not addressing cell signaling. They're not binding to ligands and things like that. It's, there's a lot of science that goes into a, a really good formulation. But antioxidant serums can be helpful for two things, boosting your hydration underneath your moisturizer and giving you additional antioxidant protection to gobble up the free radicals that slip through your sunscreen. So there's no such thing as a sunblock, guys. It's the sunscreen. Things will still get through your, your sunscreen product. So using that antioxidant serum can be great. But you can also find a lot of great moisturizers with antioxidants built in it. So really kind of become smarter consumers, guys. Don't just mm -hmm. buy all these products. Sometimes it's helpful to just have some have someone curate a routine for you. Sorry, I just had to remove someone who was posting not so nice comments. Not about us per se, but I think they're just trying to get attention. So they just got banned. I'm like, I don't I have like zero tolerance for rudeness. Okay. Um, so that's super helpful. So when we're talking about these products, really being aware of the ingredients that are in them. Um, Rachel recommended an amazing vitamin C product that I actually have to, I get two, like three tiny bottles and I actually have to activate each one when I'm finished with the last one. So Rachel's talking about, um, you know, quality of the products you're using and then making sure, you know, vitamin C is one in particular. It's my understanding. It's not very stable. So you can't like have a vitamin C serum that's going to last forever. Like you really do have to use it within a short period of time. It should be in a fairly, um, you're welcome, Rhonda. I was like, I just saw the comments popping up. I'm like, oh, we're not going to deal with that. Um, the point being, you know, quality is important, but also recognizing that some of these things, when they're exposed to air, so. anyway, so quality is certainly very important. I want to make sure that I touch on one other question that kind of ties into that. So vitamin C was one question. Um, someone said, I tried vitamin C and it bleached patches of my skin. Does that sound, that sounds more like maybe like hydroquinolone. I mean, that doesn't sound as much like vitamin C. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Vitamin C ain't going to bleach your skin. <laughs> I don't know what you There's something else in the product. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Vitamin C does not do skin bleaching. It's an antioxidant. So it helps mm -hmm. to mitigate oxidative stress in the skin aka inflammation, which is what accelerates the skin aging process. For lightening pigmentation, so lightening the melasma or age spots or, or whatever you want to call it, that's achieved through your basic skincare routine. Sure, you can add in an antioxidant serum. Sure, you could add in some skin supplements. And then there's also uh, some really great laser treatments that can build collagen at the same time, which is pretty cool. We're definitely gonna we're definitely gonna talk about those because those are some of my favorite favorite things that we can do. Someone was asking about as you're making that transition from you know you're getting your period every month and you're not necessarily menopausal yet, but you're in perimenopause. How should our skin care change as we're getting closer to when we stop getting our periods? And for anyone who's watching, perimenopause is typically the five to seven years preceding menopause. And you can start getting alterations and collagen and elastin. And, and this can mitigate a lot of the 
skincare changes that we see. And for some people, they don't care. But for a lot of us, especially those of us that have been a lot more on Zoom and video, we seem to be like more attuned to these changes the older that we're getting. Yeah. And I think it's really important to also just number one, give it grace. <laughs> Because your body is going through some pretty significant changes. Mm -hmm. So we start to really see the aging process mm -hmm. start in kind of like our early 30s, if you will. So again, the complaints of fine lines, wrinkles to the forehead, things like that, crow's feet, uh, people wanting to do kind of like the lip flip sort of thing. And then age 37 mm -hmm. to 41, there's that initial collagen drop off. So what that looks like mm -hmm. is sort of like thinning of the skin, a little bit more crepiness, a little bit... Uh, more mm -hmm. laxity, if you will. And then when we hit menopause between ages 50 to 60, there's like a 30% collagen drop off. Yeah. And this is actually in the literature. So what I talk about, I have to talk mm -hmm. about evidence based literature, right? So I'm big mm -hmm. uh, into academic articles, I write them myself, I'm on the board of a journal peer reviewer. So there was a study done in, I believe it was 27, 2018. I've shared this infographic on my Instagram, but women's faces change shape three times faster than men's between the ages of 50 to 60. So when we are noticing the initial signs of aging, first of right away, stop using the over-the-counter products that you're getting at your department store, you're getting yeah. at your pharmacy or drugstore. Those are usually just latent with hidden toxins. Even we're talking brands like Cetaphil, CeraVe, Lubriderm. Mm -hmm. You guys, you have to yeah. stop using that stuff. I don't care who's telling you to use it and who's recommending using it. They are full of hormone disruptors. And there's actually a PubMed article in 2020 that highlighted that those particular brands carry about 9 to 14 known allergens. So the conversation needs to change in the general dermatology world and kind of get with the times with mm -hmm. um, working with more smarter, savvy consumers that care about our health and wellness and aren't wanting to put toxic things on our skin or in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So yes, I recommend when you first start to notice the signs of aging, fine lines, wrinkles, skin laxity, really start to up your skincare game. The tricky thing is when you go into a clinic, typically what's going to happen, and I'm totally not cool with this, obviously, you'll get a free 15, 30 minute consult with a consultant at a clinic. They're yeah. going to be offering you skincare packages. They're going to be offering you laser packages. I spend an hour with each patient and client. It takes me a good 30 minutes just to hear yeah. my client's needs. So again, that model needs to change. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, happy to be a little bit of a disruptor in the world of rejuvenation and promote a yeah. higher level of care. But yes, making those changes is really important when you start to notice the signs of aging to more medical grade, clinical backed, research backed, cleaner products. So what are some of the ingredients that women should be looking for in their products to know what is going to be most effective? And obviously I know I'm not asking for specifics, but kind of like generalities, things that people can kind of use when they're kind of navigating the space. Let's say, for example, someone's already working with someone locally, mm -hmm. but obviously we're going to put all the links and we'll, we're going to share this, uh, you know, we're going to share this on our social media. But if people want to work directly with you, I know that makes that takes it. It's seamless. But if someone's working with someone already, what are the questions they need to be asking? What are the things they need to be looking for in terms of ingredients? Well, sometimes if a clinic only works with one, two, or three brands, that's not always a good sign. So I work with about 13. And wow. why I have to do that is because my clients come to me and they have specific needs and I need to make a protocol that's designed just for their needs. And you can't do that with just one or two lines because every line has duds and superstars. So that's why working with someone who really knows how to get results based on other clients that say, for you, Cynthia, um, I've worked with many, many lovely women with similar skin concerns to yours. So I see yeah. what works. I see what people mm -hmm. keep coming back for. And those are what my recommendations will, will go on. So that's kind of like a red flag if people only work with, you know, one or two brands. Yeah. Um, but avoiding, we want to make sure, let's just kind of uh, go this way for a second. Avoiding parabens, phthalates, mm -hmm. sulfates, artificial dyes, fragrances, not tested on animals. 
But also one of the things I'm noticing with these indie brands is sure they'll have really great ingredients, right? Like vitamin C, hyaluronic acid, copper peptide, things like that, a little bit of retinol, a little bit of glycolic acid, maybe some mandelic acid or salicylic acid. Mm -hmm. But what matters is actually the final formulation. And we're talking Mm -hmm. bioavailability again and results. So a lot of uh, brands don't necessarily invest time in third-party lab research on the efficacy of their final Mm -hmm. formula. You'll usually see claims, and we see this with a lot of celebrity skincare products, uh, especially recently, actually. They won't necessarily list the full ingredients, but what they'll do is say, oh, vitamin C does this. Oh, glycolic acid does this. Mm -hmm. Oh, copper peptide does this but then there's no lab testing on the final formula. And this is a pretty big issue with skincare and supplements right now. I I can imagine. And I, and I think there's also, unfortunately, there's this lack of transparency about, you know, photography that we see on social media or in print ads or on TV, et cetera, where people don't realize that there's so much airbrushing and there's so much that's done to people's skin that, if you met that person in real life, they wouldn't look anything like that. And so they're, they're selling a result of something that, you know, do, wouldn't even exist in real life. And I think that's huge. Tara said, Hey, from the Netherlands. Awesome. It's I saw that. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm Dutch myself. Are you? I am. I love Holland. Lots of family out there. So hello from the Netherlands. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, nice. Okay. Specific questions about what to do about creepy skin on arms and legs. Well, first of all, it's not creepy, right? Like this isn't... This is her words. I'm using this, her words. It's not, and this I was isn't like, spooky. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right. I always have a bit of fun with age, but we can't take this yeah. too seriously. Um, what do we do about creepy skin? So this is actually a question I should do a podcast episode on because I've been asked this a couple of times. What do I do about the skin on my body? Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple of things that I do right now in my mid thirties. And then there's recommendations I make for my clients more in their forties, fifties, sixties. So if you can start to, whatever you do to the face, do to the neck and the chest and hands for cleanser, moisturizer, sense, all like like one unit, not just the face. Otherwise, you'll get floating head syndrome when you're in your 60s. Not a great look. But uh, there's actually a mask I really like to recommend that I'll use it in the bathtub and I'll apply it face, chest, hands. And I'll even put a little bit on the inside of my arms. So sometimes I'll do that. I'll actually put a little bit of my leftover products from my hands on my elbows, really where I see a lot of clients in their 50s and 60s complaining about crepiness. That's the, the number one area on your, your body when you're getting sun exposure is really important. So body sunscreen when you're getting sun exposure. You can also do uh, body dermal rolling. So when it comes to dermal rolling, just, uh, just reach out to me. I'll walk you through that. No, I don't have a DIY video on YouTube. Because you need to have the proper guidance with rolling. It's don't just buy it from Amazon or eBay. You got to use the right things. You can't just use your favorite products with rolling. And uh, yeah, you can certainly actually body roll the inner arms, the knees, and and all of that stuff. I have to apologize to everyone. You're getting trolled hard, aren't you? <laughs> from what? But I cannot block live. So I think what I'm going to try to do. Do experience this before. <laughs> okay, I'm ign- I'm just ignoring it, and uh, PWR Camp says that they're ignoring it too. Let's let's carry on, my friend. Yes. So, okay. So we were talking about skin on our body that is changing. How about a sagging jawline? Anything to slow or stop it? I, I'm assuming this is also related to the loss of estrogen and, uh, you know, estradiol, collagen, elastin, et cetera, that are all kind of driving those changes. But uh, this is something that a lot of my girlfriends are starting to talk about. They're like turning and going, what happened to my jawline? Like, where did it go? Yeah. All right. So here we go. I published a paper. It's getting published at the end of the month on my jawline enhancement algorithm. Last year, I published a paper on rejuvenation to the brows and eyes. So to avoid tear trough fillers, because that's mm-hmm. probably one of the 
do not do teardrop fillers, guys. That's when people get like the chipmunk. It's like it just looks disproportionate. Tear, teardrop fillers, sometimes people will get, um, this isn't medical advice, by the way, the guys. Tindle. This is educational information only. If you think you have a medical condition, you must seek the guidance of a licensed physician. Gotta say it. Uh, mm-hmm. So I started to take note of these trendy treatments and the tear trough filling is one of those. And people mm-hmm. get this done in an effort to get rid of dark circles and under eye bags. But what you don't see on those social media before and after images is what happens a month later, nine months later, three years later, nine years later. So I wrote a paper to give people alternatives to tear troughs. Uh, this is for providers. It's published in the Plastic Surgical Nursing Journal. You can just Google my name on PubMed and find my, my work there. Mm-hmm. But uh, my jawline paper. So what happens is we get the um, bulkiness of the DAO muscle. So if mm-hmm. y'all can pinch your face with us, this is super fun. So there's a muscle here that gets kind of big and bulky with talking mm-hmm. and chewing, right? It's like when you work out, you're your yeah. biceps get bigger, right? Uh, and when you don't work out, they atrophy. So there's actually some products that we can use to actually shrink the jowls. And I'm not going to mention like specific drug names and stuff like that. I'll talk about that in a, in a consult. But we can shrink the jowls and actually prevent the jowls from forming, which is fabulous. And also, we oftentimes get a little bit of a kind of a little bit of laxity right here in the submental mm-hmm. area. And there's a lot of injectable treatments on the market that haven't really been around for very long. So I like uh, safeties and data. I do actually have a bit of a seven, eight year rule with products and procedures that I will employ on my dear clients because I do not want them to be guinea pigs. The uh, There is um, sometimes fat. There's also a gland and some muscles here. So there are some ways to kind of modulate uh, those tissue structures. So we got the jowls getting big and bulky. We lose some of our bone in mm-hmm. our, our lower and upper maxilla, which is like our jawbone, and it recesses back. Then we also lose fat in the cheeks. And what mm-hmm. happens when we lose fat pad in the cheeks, when we lose bone in our upper lower maxilla, maxilla everything falls, right? Gravity yeah. wins. So then we get the sag down here. So treating the jawline is a bit of a multifaceted approach. It, you're not going to get it done with, you know, a skin lifting and tightening laser treatment. Unfortunately, that's a bit also a bit of a gimmick out there. Mm-hmm. Is that unfortunately, people think that, you know, they're shown these very transformative before and after photos. But what they don't realize is that often to really get that nice, smooth jawline and structure back in the face, it's taking a couple of different modalities to mm-hmm. get it done. And I think that's important for people to understand. It's not like they walked into the you know surgeon's office or your office and it was one treatment and it was probably something topical and that took care of everything there's multiple ways to kind of address this probably much more common as we are getting older chronologically and what i find really interesting is uh you know back when i was practicing as a nurse practitioner in cardiology i would sometimes get women that had too much filler underneath their eyes mm. and they would get something called the tyndall effect it would literally turn blue or almost this bluish tinge to their skin, which thankfully can be reversed. And I'm sure you occasionally see that. There are probably people that come to you to have that fixed. But that's why I wrote that paper because I was tired of fixing botched tear troughs two, three times a week. So I was like, okay, enough is enough. I got to put some data out there in the world and add to the body of knowledge of aesthetic medicine and aesthetic nursing because that's exactly what happens. So if we look at our wrist, so you see how you can see my veins on my Mm -hmm. wrist, it looks blue. The same thing can happen when we have fillers placed a little too superficially in the skin or in the tear trough and it starts to move and migrate because that's what's going to happen with fillers it will move and migrate a little bit and uh, when the light hits the filler it can actually give that blue some products are going to be a little bit more um, prone to tindling than others so there's so many options like i can't expect everybody on here to to kind of like grasp how all these things work together that I've spent 10 years learning about and teach on. Yeah. There's a lot to know, but yeah, Tyndall effect in the tear trough area is a big issue. Yeah, you definitely don't want that. Okay, next question. I know you touched on medical grade, clean skincare and your thoughts on retinol. Uh, one woman said, I've read that it was never tested for long-term use. What are your thoughts on retinols? I mean, retinol has been used since the 80s. 
That's long pretty term. long. That's pretty long term to me. That's like 40 years. <laughs> yeah. So I dig it. I, I like the long term efficacy stuff. I mean, there's tons of studies on retinol. Um, yeah. I love retinol, but I can't tolerate a lot of it myself. Right. So I like to integrate it. Yeah. I like to integrate it alongside my dermal rolling. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll use products that just have like a sprinkling of it too. Like in one of the neck creams that I am obsessed with. And, uh, yeah, it's a very potent antioxidant. What it does is it speeds up your cell cycle. So mm -hmm. as we age, our cell cycle gets longer, right? So for me, my cell cycle is probably about 30 days. So that's how long it takes from the skin cells down below to make their way up to the surface where you can see it. As we age, it starts to slow down. It can get up mm -hmm. to like 40, you know, 40 days. So in that delayed skin cell cycle process, your skin cells, once they reach the top, might look a little bit kind of like lackluster, if you will. So vitamin A can be great, but you have to be guided on how to do it. So don't yep. just hope for the best and buy a vitamin A or buy a dermal roller. There is a process to start to yeah. whisper to your skin, talk to it, and then have conversations with it. So that's what I hold the hands of my clients with. I love that. Um, I want to answer this question. Do you recommend collagen supplements? Heck because yes. I know you do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do I ever? Speaking of collagen, maybe I'll just take some right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually, again, I, I work with uh, a number of different products, and I'm always excited about new things. I won't necessarily say, like, brands on these uh, platforms because, obviously, there are other companies. I'm not paid to talk about the companies. But mm -hmm. uh, they are on my e-store, some of my favorites. You can check them out there. So this is actually marine collagen. I just put some of this in my Bulletproof coffee. It's sustainably sourced. So when we're talking collagen, we're talking marine, we're talking poultry, we're talking porcine, or we're talking beef, right? There's many different ways that you can get collagen. Vegan collagen doesn't really exist. That's kind of gross. And uh, yeah, collagen is great. I, I used to honestly poo-poo it because it's it's been so kind of... I swept under the rug in aesthetic medicine and aesthetic nursing. And then I started taking it for the last year and a half. And I'm actually blown away at how much fewer treatments like skin, laser, injectable stuff mm -hmm. that I have to do because I have more collagen. And I noticed a massive difference in my dad's hands. Actually, he's got old carpenter man hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and after even just a month or two of taking uh, collagen with cofactors, uh, his skin turgor started to improve and collagen it's one of the most abundant proteins in our bodies it will get used elsewhere in the body for your connective tissue and things like that but it won't magically place itself into that fine line or wrinkle here it's going to support you all over but uh, yeah i am a fan of one collagen brand in particular because it's got hydrolyzed collagen lysine vitamin c and silicon and it's sustainably farmed and sourced so you need to care about that so I kind of do that research for you guys and sift through the data and the best products and brands. Absolutely. And I think it's really important. One of the things Rachel is saying over and over again is she's not going to give specific brands because she wants you to work either, you know, come see her for a consult or work with someone locally so that you're getting really good information. But also very, yes. my recommendations might change in three to six months. Because right. that happens too. It's like, oh, there's a new, better kid on the block, mm -hmm. right? So th that's also a reason for that. Yeah, and she also has some great recommendations on her website. Great content, great sources. Um, let's pivot a little bit. Someone asked, are facials beneficial? Was it, what is something that is a must for maintaining young, vibrant skin? So I think we're going to pivot and start talking a little bit about treatments. And so a facial, my understanding of facials is they feel wonderful, uh, back pre-COVID, I loved doing dermaplaning during the summer. It was just really kind of a cool way to, you know, exfoliate a little bit more, get a little peach fuzz off my face. But what are your thoughts on facials? Are they just all for, is it really just pampering you or is there a lot to do? Like I know, for example, um, there was one place I used to go to for facials years ago before I had kids and they used to talk about, oh, we've got this amazing collagen, you know, facial that we can do. And I'm like, I thought collagen was kind of large. It's a little too hard to absorb directly through your skin. I mean, I might have known a little bit more than the average person, but what are your thoughts on facials? I like specific types of facials. Uh, mm -hmm. My recommendation, if you're wanting to do something relaxing at the spa, get yourself a massage, 
get yourself a pedicure. But when it comes to the face, I do recommend other types of treatments that are along the lines of dermal infusions. So we're talking like a full on wet vac for the face. So you know how you can clean your carpet and upholstery with a wet vac machine? There are some great um, products and procedures out there that can actually do just that. And alongside, give you a really nice gentle chemical peel. And don't freak out that I just said the word chemical peel. You don't always have to pull a Samantha from Sex in the City after having <laughs> a chemical peel or have your face peel off. There are different percentages of glycolic mm -hmm. acid and salicylic acid that's available. Uh, but yes, I do have a specific recommendation for um, a treatment that I love, which obviously I'll disclose when you work with me one-on-one -on -one and kind of give you a plan and let you know how many uh, treatments that I could recommend and find a clinic near you that has it. But yes, there is one that I highly recommend every change of season. Cynthia, you already have that information. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's not going to be the one thing that's going to get rid of your pigmentation, broken mm -hmm. capillaries, built collagen, get rid of fine lines and wrinkles. It's kind of like a supplementary treatment. Uh, a way to kind of refresh the skin and exfoliate the skin and hydrate it. So that's what you can expect with this one particular recommendation. I think it's one of those things where so many of us have been amiss to be able to do things that are really, truly relaxing, given uh, the restrictions we've had in our lives over the past year. Someone was saying today uh, at a store I was at, they were like, it was one year ago today that everyone's lives changed forever. Uh, and I thought to myself, I was like, that's true. I was like, the new normal has become the new normal for sure. That's so such a trigger word for me, Cynthia. <laughs> the new normal. I know. Oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, my such kids are back word. in school. So I feel like, you know, awesome. we're, some degree of normalcy is starting to become available. So we talked a little bit about facials. Let's talk about lasers. This is a question I get a lot. I'm very upfront that I do per fractional once a year. People always want to know what it is what it does for you. I always say it's like a great bang for your buck, meaning, you know, for what I feel like it costs, it, it gives me a lot of benefit. So let's talk about laser therapies. Yeah, there was a, we'll talk about lasers in a hot second, but there was a question about my personal skincare routine. Mm -hmm. Lucky for you, I actually just did my story of what I put on my face last night alongside my red light therapy because I'm big into biohacking mm -hmm. as well. So check out my story and uh, you can get access to some of my favorite products. It, there's like a little swipe up function. So for mm -hmm. lasers, I love laser therapies but not all lasers. I spent about two years getting my hands on some of the quote unquote best lasers out there. And I was so disappointed with most of the technology that you'll see in med spas, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And for example, they were too painful. They took too long. The recovery was too long or it didn't work. It wasn't worth the cost of the treatment. Okay. So uh, there's really only about two or three lasers that I would honestly trust with myself and my friends and family and my clients. And there's a lot of garbage out there as well. Mm -hmm. So specific laser treatments will make your skin look a certain way. Mm -hmm. So some of the older lasers that were kind of held on a pedestal uh, 10 years ago, they actually can make the skin look very thin, uh, almost like thin, like an eggshell and very ghostly like, and you will actually not be able to do the full face around the eyes, nose, lips, neck properly because they're kind of like rolled on the skin. So you can't get the contoured areas um, as well. So what I was starting to notice with uh, clients that were coming to see me and that had had previous laser treatments elsewhere, mm. I'm not going to say the specific brand name, uh, but they had big sections of their faces where it wasn't treated with the laser. And mm. so some of the skin would look smooth and then others would still have really large pores and look really crepey. So certain lasers can be more detailed. Uh, mm -hmm. And also we are in a bit of an era of the lazy laser technician. So that also matters. Finding someone that actually is going to pay attention to the details of your facial contours and give you a really, really great treatment. So there's um, basically two types of lasers that I really like to recommend. Um, but it, it depends on your skin type. So I have to be very careful what I say online because if I make a blanket statement and then somebody goes and does something, 
right. you know, I'm not going to be liable for that because I didn't make a specific recommendation right. for everybody. Uh, so it really kind of depends on actually your skin type and your skin goals as to what lasers could be most helpful for you. But, you know, there is a lot of stuff to all avoid in the, um, in the med spas that are generally offered that are going to be kind of like a waste of your time and money. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> So, so what are the things people should be asking before considering doing a laser procedure? Maybe that's the way to circumvent the, so they, they can, you can yes. be your own best advocate. Absolutely. Um, number one, you need to see before and after photos from the provider, right? We're just seeing stock photos from the laser manufacturer, that's not what you want to see. You want to see results actually from the person who's been doing your treatments. Um, usually it takes a couple of years to really get a handle on good technology. And so if you can find someone who, I mean, I help people. Why am I saying this? I, this is what I do. I help people find clinicians. But uh, when clinics have certain types of technologies that cost $140,000 for some of these lasers, that's usually a good sign. When they have technologies that are more like twenty dollars to $40,000 that are going to be a little bit more subpar, then that can also be not a great sign. But when you're, when you're meeting with the clinician, you want to get a sense of their confidence and competency. If you kind of feel like they're a bit nervous with you, they don't necessarily can answer your questions to the um, degree that you are hoping for, then that's also something to look out for as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's kind of interesting. I never normally have trolls and there have been, I've been blocking and deflecting calls this entire time so rachel they must just be so inundated they want to connect with you <laughs> yeah i'm really so. picky who i connect with i do not work with just anybody i work with clients mm -hmm. that are um, really into the journey and i actually attract really beautiful clients that are already looking after themselves and they're just wanting to um you know really up upgrade how they're living and they want to look as good as they're as they feel which is which is great i would just i would just ignore them because there's a lot there's like 50 people that are enjoying this conversation <laughs> yeah no no as i'm saying i'm just trying to make sure i pull the people out that are serving as a source of distraction so let's go the next level up so we've talked about products we've talked about advocacy when it comes to procedures so let's talk about um neuromodulators fillers things like that, because I think there's a lot of misinformation. And I think so much of it is really, um, I always say there's a lot of science, but also a lot of artistry. And I'm sure you see quite a bit of this in the aesthetics industry, but certainly for me as a clinician, uh, I always use the example that, you know, when I, back when I was still taking students, I had a student with me and there was this lovely woman who had had way too much filler in her face and it looked very hard and she was very young and it was just very obvious. She looked almost like a caricature. And my student who was, you know, pretty young was like, what's wrong with her face? And I said, you know, this is that balance of, you know, artistry and science. And sometimes it goes in the wrong direction. Like sometimes people don't even realize, um, someone said, I'm in the United States. So I don't know if you offer virtual consultations. Yes, she does. Sure yes, do. just, just send me a DM or go to rachelvarga.ca and book a call with me and use promo code Cynthia Thurlow for 51% yeah. off. So I yeah. can track it back to Cynthia and share the love that way. Yeah. So let's kind of talk about, um, you know, when, when someone comes to you and this is something that they're interested in, let's talk about the differences between neuromodulators and fillers and what they do so that people can be their own best advocates. Absolutely. This is a great question. So if you think about neuromodulators and fillers, they're totally different products. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we look at celebrities and their lips are too big, we, people think that that's like Botox or neuromodulators, nope. right? <laughs> um, yeah. So different products are going to do different things. Similarly to how a cleanser and a moisturizer do different things, mm -hmm. right? They're kind of skincare products, but they're totally different. So neuromodulators work by changing the message from the nerve to the muscle. Mm -hmm. So when we were talking about the jawline earlier, this muscle gets activated with talking and chewing, mm -hmm. and we can actually um, adjust the, the motion of the muscle to get an impact such as slimming or such as lifting. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take a look at my paper on PubMed, just look me up Rachel Varga um, on PubMed, you'll see my paper and I actually have a graph 
in that paper, so I always have to talk about published data, right? It's really important as a clinician evidence-based practice. There are different types of neuromodulators on the market, and some of them are cleaner than others. Again, I'm not going to reference brands, but you can take a look at that uh, in the published data in my paper. So some neuromodulators have extra preservatives and complexing proteins that don't actually serve a function, but can actually, over time, people can, it, they, it can stop working for them because of that. They can develop antibodies, which is very interesting. Again, this is in the literature. So I am a um, more of a fan of a cleaner type of neuromodulator. So I'm absolutely happy to share that. Um, it's in my paper or I'll share in a call. But they're great for, you know, lifting the brows, opening up the eyes, um, kind of refreshing the lines on the forehead. Um, and that's kind of about it. But it will also give the skin a little bit of glassiness. I also really like them because they help with headaches that I get from a uh, whiplash injury. So there's also that. Um, and dermal fillers is hyaluronic acid. So hyaluronic acid is something that's already present in the skin. And we lose bone and fat in the face and collagen, as we mentioned before. So hyaluronic acid can be used to reinflate the tissue, right? So when everybody comes to see me and they're like, Rachel, do this, <laughs> right? It can actually come down to sometimes uh, putting back a little bit more volume. And that being said, just because it's hyaluronic acid and it's already in the skin doesn't mean that it's a benign treatment. These need to be performed by regulated professional board certified providers. We're not talking somebody that's just taken a weekend course and now they're ready to roll, right? You yes. want to find people that uh, number one, take a look at them. If they look crazy, you'll look crazy. It's just a matter of time. You know, we're thinking duck lips, golf ball, chipmunk cheeks, things like that. And uh, yeah, really they, when they're done well, it can look wonderful and just replace some of the lost bone fat and collagen in the skin and put some more structure back. Uh, but they do carry a risk of blindness, um, blockage of blood flow to other areas of the face and also migration. So I am a really big fan of really prioritizing skin health first. So really good lifestyle practices like taking your collagen, taking your supplements, exercising, grounding, getting outside, having body, mind, spirit, energy cultivated practices. I'm a huge mm -hmm. component of more of this concept of holistic beauty. And then you got your skincare, you got your dermal rolling stuff at home, your red light therapy, all that good stuff. And then, yeah, do some of the laser treatments and then injectables really only when you need to. That's a different approach than what I typically see in the world of anti-aging and rejuvenation. But that's just going to allow you to look more natural and focus on your skin health first, as opposed to just diving straight into an injectable treatment. Because when the, the skin is in better shape, you'll need fewer injectables, which is great. That's such a good point. And I would love for you to kind of, because I want to be respectful of your time, I'd love for you to talk about the biohacking devices that you're talking about. I actually have a germ roller, which makes me realize I need to be using it more often. But let's talk about germ rollers. Let's talk about red light therapy. Let's mm -hmm. talk about other things that people can do. I want you to definitely talk about the NV pillow, which I bought at your recommendation. And I love, I haven't had neck pain in over a year. Fabulous. It's buying that pillow. And it's a pillow. <laughs> it's such an easy thing to buy. I love so, it. Let's dive into that. Yeah, dermal rolling is a decades old practice to promote collagen in the skin. So where I get my information, actually, the godfather of dermal rolling lives in the city where I live. And I am in close connection with the individual that also was part of the research studies uh, from the 90s. And I use particular products that are determined to be safe and effective with dermal rolling. So word to the wise, do not get your dermal rollers from Amazon or eBay or anything like that, because the little needles sometimes in these really low quality rollers um, are actually blades up close when you look at them in a microscope and they can actually be an alloy. So not just surgical steel or titanium, they can be a mix of who knows what the heck type of metal is in that. And then you do need to uh, make sure you're using a specific depth. So I don't really talk about depth recommendations um, in content here because what I find is people will take that and roll with it. And there mm -hmm. is a progression. So stabilizing your skincare, using your skin actives, and then dermal rolling. So I walk all my clients through that. Mm -hmm. And that's really key to not just 
buy a roller and a roller depth that you'll see someone talking about online. I actually don't do that. You have to meet with me for me to, to get access to the rollers that I work with. But there are different depths and you can slowly progress to a deeper depth depending on what your needs are. If you have acne scars or melasma, then sometimes using something a little bit deeper can be helpful. But if you've never done anything, you're, we're going to want to start, we're going to want to start you as sort of like a lower um, depth first. But yeah, I wouldn't buy these rollers or these stampers off Amazon or eBay. You shouldn't see blood, <laughs> right? You'll no. see blood within clinic microneedling with PRP. Mm -hmm. I do have some alternative recommendations for that instead of that. But yeah, it's such a great, dermal rolling is a great cost-effective method to promote collagen at home. You can do your face, you can do your eyelids, you can do your lips with it, your neck, your chest, anywhere you're wanting to promote collagen. But you, you just need a little bit of guidance to do it. And there are a lot of people talking about dermal rolling online, on YouTube, on the online space that don't actually, they're not actually giving good advice because they don't really know what they're talking about. So that's really important. I've been working uh, with dermal rolling with my clients for the last 10 years. And one of my clients I saw yesterday, she's in her mid sixties and she looks incredible. I actually, I did a, a laser treatment for her yesterday and her skin, again, she's in her mid sixties. Her skin feels like 30 year old skin to me with the amount of collagen Amazing. that's in it. Yeah, it's great. So question for you, are you able to distinguish, you know, once a woman's gone through menopause, people that are taking bioidenticals versus those that are not, I'm sure you're seeing a significant alteration in the way that the skin responds to therapies, I would imagine, because for anyone who doesn't know, um, estrogen and progesterone are what kind of, well, as women transition into no longer getting their menstrual cycles, our progesterone uh, is predominantly produced by the adrenal glands and estrogen is predominantly produced in fat tissue. So it goes from estradiol, which is the more bioavailable form that most people, uh, women experience up until they go through menopause and then it becomes estrone. So I would imagine women that are not using bioidenticals or even synthetic hormones in menopause, there's probably a significant net difference in the way that their skin responds. I would imagine, I'm just, that's like my working hypothesis. Yeah, honestly, when clients work with me and they haven't investigated their hormones yet, um, that's definitely something I do encourage women to mm -hmm. look at. So you really hit the nail on the head there because hormones are everything. Our yeah. hormones are medi mediated by the ions in our bodies. So that's why it's important to do things like certain biohacking technologies mm -hmm. and, and lots of free stuff like grounding to help um, to keep our ions in our body balanced and grounded. Uh, this mm -hmm. is very important. But when I work with clients in their 50s and 60s, which is, you know, a majority of who I work with are mm -hmm. women kind of 40 to 60, which is great because they're noticing those signs of aging and they're thinking, yeah. I, I don't really look as good as I feel. I love right. helping uh, men and women through that but yes, sometimes uh, when the skin hasn't been looked after for decades, you do have to take a certain progression to mitigate, mm -hmm. um, you know, sensitivities and things like that. Sure. Absolutely. Well, I just know that, you know, I have clients that will tell me they'll share on their own that they are in bioidenticals. Others are not. Um, if someone's been, if someone has been a big sun wor worshiper, has been a smoker, eats, you know, a very processed diet, you can really see the net impact on the skin. What are some of the other things that you see will have a negative impact on skin turgor, skin texture as people are getting older? Certainly smoking, mm -hmm. obviously. And also just like the quality of air around them. So I actually have air purifiers in my home because what happens with the skin is we can actually get impurities sitting on the skin. We're talking dirt and debris in the air, pollution. There's higher rates of acne in uh, places like Beijing. This is actually in the published literature because of uh, particulates in the air. So making sure that your environment is clean, you're not smoking, you're really limiting your alcohol. Last time I checked, alcohol wasn't good for anybody. There are cleaner mm. forms of alcohol. Again, there's third-party lab-tested clean alcohol, right? Dry Farm Wines is one of those companies that we both love. Mm. Yeah. Um, but one of the interesting things that you probably aren't going to expect me to say, 
But having worked with so many clients over the last 10 years, you start to take notice of what certain individuals are doing that are crushing life and their skin looks Mm -hmm. beautiful and radiant. And honestly, that is having a cultivated practice and awareness Mm -hmm. of your body, mind, spirit, and energy and doing things to support all of those aspects of your health and wellness. I actually have a machine right here uh, that I can actually test my human bio field with and chakras. Really? Interestingly enough, right here, this is actually Russian technology uh, because I I do um, some experiments on uh, different gadgets. For example, I have the Somavetic behind me. I'm wearing the Art Crystal. I use the Juve Red Light Therapy. I talk about all this stuff on the Rachel Varga podcast, but I want to know stuff's working. I use the aura ring to track my sleep, right? We, I don't want to guess that stuff that I'm, that I'm buying or using on myself is working. I want to know it's working. So that just comes down to being a researcher and a huge nerd. But um, yeah, we actually emit light from our faces. The highest light emitters on our body our palms, fingertips, and faces, which is really important. Really, really really cool. Yeah. You can actually see this through technology called Kirlon photography, which is pretty Mm -hmm. unreal. Um, So when you are kind of balanced, grounded, centered, and aligned, you're going to emit a different kind of like coherent light from you. So this is kind of a bit woo, but it's also highly scientific because I got a detector mm-hmm. that can tell me how many joules I'm, I'm outputting in a day, what my biofield around me looks like, some things I might want to work on, uh, organ systems to support, for example, my liver, or if I'm sitting too long, actually my sacrum will pop up. It's really interesting. Interesting. Well, we'll have to talk offline about all that. Now I do have one more question because I saw someone put it in the the questions. Yes, most of my ladies are 40s, 50s and beyond. But this young lady was asking, what would be your recommendations for just kind of generalized recommendations for the average 30 something? What should they start thinking about? Obviously, a lot of people in their 30s are having babies. And, you know, this is definitely a time when product selection is uber critical because you don't want anything, you know, our skin is our largest organ and anything we put on our skin gets absorbed into our bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Have a basic solid routine, cleanse, moisturize, sunscreen, Mm -hmm. scrub, reach out for specific product recommendations. I'm happy to make them for you. Just send me a DM. We'll go from there. Uh, But really leaning into what you do at home and then having, you know, really succinct plan of, okay, maybe what to do in the office, like one of the facial treatments that I love to do, or maybe a laser treatment for reducing uh, pigmentation in the skin, broken capillaries, diffuse redness, red acne scars start to promote collagen. So certainly in the 30s, starting to integrate a little bit of that at home routine, get the dermal rolling going, but maybe also start to get some laser treatments. Um, to keep the collagen levels up so that you are prophylactically maintaining and building your collagen before that steep estrogen drop off, because it's going to happen. Oh, totally. Totally. Well, thank you so much for your time, my beautiful friend. Um, We will make sure that, you know, anyone that reaches out to us, we're going to be sharing this within some of our Facebook groups. Um, Obviously, we're going to connect again. I know that my ladies, especially a lot of my ladies who work full time, sent me this laundry list of questions. Uh, Everyone's always interested in skincare. And you're obviously one of my favorite uh, aesthetic people. So let everyone know how to connect with you. I know you've mentioned that you'll open up your DMs and you've got great resources. You've got a great you've got two great podcasts. But what's the easiest way to connect with you? Yeah, just over Instagram here or send me an email, info at rachelvarga.ca. You can check out some of my favorite product recommendations, book a virtual consultation with me from anywhere in the world at rachelvarga.ca. Uh, use promo code Cynthia Thurlow for 15% off of your virtual call with me. And everything that's included in the consult is listed um, mm-hmm. at the booking page, which is great. So that'll answer some of your questions of, you know, what's really included in that hour with me. And then the ongoing support afterwards, uh, because I love hearing from my clients. And yeah, there's going to be questions that are going to pop up with every change of season. I help my clients um, kind of tweak their skincare routine based on what's going on. I know Cynthia, we did that for you recently. I have a ton of free content on the Rachel Varga podcast and YouTube channel and also beauty in the biohacker podcast. So for all things, body, mind, spirit, energy, optimization, that's on the Rachel Varga podcast. Uh, Yeah. So it's pretty, uh, lots of free stuff that I, that I do as well. 
Awesome. And maybe the next time what we'll do is we'll actually talk through the regimen you have for me and, and we'll do it as this is, you know, some of the, obviously a couple things, we'll talk about a couple of my favorite products, um, but just it's maybe the why behind the recommendation. Maybe people will find that interesting. People always want to know what I'm doing. I'm sure just like they do for you. Uh, and sometimes when you have another expert on board, you know, Rachel is the skin aesthetics expert. Um, I can just know that the, the impact of using higher quality products is it makes a huge difference. Like I have no problems telling people how old I am. I'm not trying to look 20, but I do think that, you know, you can age in a way that is very, very graceful and, you know, you look age appropriate, but you don't have to turn up into a wrinkled old prune. <laughs> which is Certainly, my... but also you don't have to break the bank. So I definitely Correct. keep that in mind. I work with celebrities and tech moguls mm -hmm. to, you know, people living on a pension and everybody mm -hmm. in between. So I'm happy to create a plan for at home and in the clinic that is going to be in accordance with your budget lifestyle mm -hmm. and also what's important to you. Absolutely. And uh, I have to let everyone know, this is the first time I've ever done a, uh, Instagram live where I've had to turn off commenting. And now that I know I can do that, I would have started with that. So if there were any comments that offended anyone, I can't apologize for other people's bad behavior, but all those people got blocked and reported. <laughs> so, but there were some really great questions that yes. came in and yeah. I hate doing that. I'm, I'm very much a free speech person, but when, you know, certain words start flying, I'm like, okay, I've had enough. But yes, definitely check out Rachel. We'll do this again. Thank you, Rachel, again for your time. I know it's a little bit earlier in the day for you. I'm jumping off because I've got to go grab a kiddo off the bus. All right. Nice to connect. We'll have you back on the show too. Sounds good. Bye, everybody. Bye.